I'm Tim Constantine, and from Washington, D.C., this is the Capitol Hill Show. American policies and decisions often have a big impact all over the world. In 2024, the United States will elect a president. The election isn't until November, but the field of candidates is rapidly narrowing. The U.S. has a population of almost 340 million people, but at this point, less than 10 Americans have a realistic chance of being elected president in 2024. I'll sit down with one of them later in this show. America is essentially a two-party political system, the Democrats and the Republicans. The leading candidate for the Democratic nomination in 2024 is currently President Joe Biden. He has only token opposition within his party at this point, and despite that, though, the general public is not so sure. He is not particularly popular. He has only a 39% approval rating, high inflation, open borders, and a perception that he's weak on foreign policy, plus the fact that he's 81 years old and looks, acts, and sounds every year of it have combined so that many, even within his own party, don't think he should run for re-election. In fact, one recent poll showed that among likely Democrat voters, the president's own party, they preferred Michelle Obama, the wife of former President Barack Obama, over Biden as their nominee. They preferred her by a margin of 45% to 43%. The Republican Party has several candidates hoping to be their party's choice in 2024, one of whom will be here with us in a matter of minutes. Leading them all, however, is former President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Trump, of course, enjoyed a strong economy during his four years and successfully brought some factions together in the Middle East. Trump, however, is brash and seemingly courts controversy everywhere he goes. He's currently fighting multiple legal charges in both federal and state courts, costing him time, money, and potentially costing him his own freedom. This is the greatest witch hunt in the history of our country. There has never been another president or perhaps even another politician who has been persecuted, harassed, and in every other way unfairly treated like President Donald J. Trump. What's fascinating is that several prominent polls suggest a significant chunk of American voters don't want a Biden-Trump rematch of the 2020 contest. The logical question, of course, what are the alternatives? I mentioned the two political parties, but there's one prominent name that's running for president with no party affiliation at all. His name, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He's the son of the 1968 American presidential candidate, Robert Kennedy, who was assassinated while he campaigned in California for the position of president. Just one year ago today. Kennedy is also the nephew of the president of the United States elected in 1960, John F. Kennedy. Of course, John F. Kennedy was also killed by an assassin. Robert F. Kennedy is not running as a Democrat. He is not running as a Republican. He is running as an independent. At least one major American pollster shows him gaining 22% of the vote. And another poll shows him winning outright with voters under the age of 45 in six U.S. states. Some Democrats quietly speculate and worry that a Kennedy candidacy can't win, but that it can siphon off enough votes from President Biden that Trump ends up with the most votes and a victory. Finally, there are several other candidates that are challenging Donald Trump for the Republican nod. Trump is 77 years old. He's facing serious legal charges that threaten to put him in jail for years to come. Three of those challenges now get viable polling numbers, and one of them could end up being the party's nominee if for any reason Trump is not. And Donald Trump's a lot different guy than he was in 2016. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. One of the current Republican challengers is the governor of the state of Florida, Ron DeSantis. 
He was first elected as governor in 2018 and won re-election to that post in 2022, winning by a margin of roughly 20 percent. His presidential campaign launched with great fanfare and great expectations. People thought he would provide a strong challenge to Donald Trump, but the campaign sputtered out of the gate and seems to have stalled a bit. Another Republican is the former governor of South Carolina and former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. She served as governor for eight years and ironically served in her position as ambassador to the U.N. at the request of then U.S. President and now her primary opponent, Donald Trump. The third Republican getting real attention for challenging Trump is a 38-year-old self-made centimillionaire named Vivek Ramaswamy. He will be here on the Capitol Hill Show in just a matter of minutes. He openly admires former President Donald Trump. He's a Republican, but appears to have picked up some of his campaigning style from a Democrat, former President Barack Obama. Ramaswamy is the son of legal American immigrants. They came from India. He was born and grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, a Midwestern American town that's located right in the heart of the country. Vivek Ramaswamy is married. He has two children. He has more money than he could spend in a lifetime. Yet he yearns for more. Why? What does this young man want? Why does he want to be president of the United States? What qualifies him? How is he different or better than the other candidates? Is he even better? Those are questions for the Republican voters and frankly, they're questions for Ramaswamy himself. In the winter and spring of 2024, individual U.S. states will hold primaries and caucuses and each party will choose who's going to represent them in the race for president next fall. The state of Iowa is the very first state to decide. They'll caucus in January. Iowa is where I found and spent time with Vivek Ramaswamy. He is stopping in every Iowa county, all 99 of them. No small feat. In fact, on the day I was with him, he visited six different counties. A marathon pace he keeps up almost every day. One of the stops, he took time out to sit down with us and answer some questions. Vivek Ramaswamy, thanks for joining us. It's good to be here. Great to see you. Now, what happens at age 38, where you wake up one day and you think, I want to make a difference in my community, but not in your homeowners association, yep. not by running for the local school board, not even mayor or governor. You think, I think my first stop should be president of the United States. How did you come to that? Well, I came to that because I've been taking on bureaucracies my entire career. I took on the bureaucracy of Big Pharma, built a multi-billion dollar business from scratch starting in my late 20s. I then took on the bureaucracy of the ESG cartel, building the largest and most successful anti-ESG movement in America, including a business called Strive to compete directly against BlackRock. But now I'm in this to take on the biggest bureaucracy of all. That's the one in the federal government. I've lived the American dream. I'm genuinely worried that Unless somebody steps up, and I do think it's going to take someone from the outside and from the next generation to do this, but unless st somebody steps up to revive our national identity, I don't think we're going to have that American dream for my kids and their generation. You're running so for the, a purpose. You're running for the Republican nomination. Yep. You also have publicly acknowledged you're a great admirer of Donald Trump. Yep. Why are you running against Donald Trump? I respect Donald Trump and his accomplishments for this country. That's just a fact that he kept us out of major wars and grew the economy. So I'm not going to be like the other candidates and Monday morning quarterback some decision he made. But I think it's going to take a leader from the next generation, somebody with fresh legs to lead this nation to the next level, to reach the next generation. We're reaching young people at a scale the Republican Party has not done, probably in generations. We're going to college campuses, bringing people into this movement that don't even consider themselves traditional Republicans but who love this country and our founding ideals. And so I think I can do that better than anybody else in this race. I am an America First conservative, but to put this country first, we now have to rediscover what this country is. 
and I think I can best do that than anybody else in this race, and that's why I'm in it. There's a wide field of Republicans running, but realistically, you are one of three that have a fair shot at challenging yep. Donald Trump. You've said on stage at the first debate, you say it as part of your stump speech, all the other Republicans are bought and paid for. Yep. You also have said at the third debate, you said Ronna McDaniel should resign immediately. She can come right up here on stage yep. and resign. Is that a good path to trying to win the Republican nomination, saying all of the candidates are corrupt and the chairperson should go? Look, my path is speaking the truth. I would rather speak the truth and lose an election than to win by playing some political snakes and ladders. But my sense from being in these rooms in Iowa and New Hampshire and across this country is that's what our base is also looking for, is somebody who speaks that truth without being attached to a personal result. There's a reason why I'm the only candidate in this race who can say certain things that are true, that Ukraine's not some model democracy, that the climate change agenda is a hoax because it has nothing to do with the climate, that Ronna McDaniel should resign, that I'll pardon peaceful January 6th protesters, that the carbon capture pipeline here in this state of Iowa unconstitutionally violates eminent domain laws and rules. I can say those things because I'm not bought and paid for. Every politician in both parties dances to the tune of their biggest donor. And in my case, that biggest donor is me. I think that's unique. It's what allows me to speak with the latitude that I am. Ronna McDaniel, the chairwoman of the RNC, she almost proved my point when after that debate, she said, I would not get another cent of funding from the RNC. It's not her money. She pretends like it is. That proves my point about the corruption in both parties and why it's going to take an outsider to fix this, and I am the outsider in this race. You mentioned Ukraine. Let's talk about America's role in the world. Sure. Of course, the war going on in Ukraine with Russia. Right now, there's the conflict uh, with Israel in Gaza, and there's a, a big debate, especially on college campuses, big debate as to where America should be. Whose side should we be on? Who's our friend? Who's our ally? Who's our enemy? Who is our friend, and what should we be doing for our friends and allies? Well, no doubt that Israel is an ally of the United States, and Israel and Ukraine are not the same situation. So I think you have to look at each situation uniquely through the lens of what advances American interests. This is where I'm a little bit different than a lot of other traditional, old-school Dick Cheney conservatives, okay? I believe that in the same way as a father, my moral obligation is to my family. As the next president, my sole moral duty is to the citizens of this nation. I don't believe the war in Ukraine advances American interests. To the contrary, I think that we should be using our own money to protect our own homeland. Conversely, we're actually driving Russia further into China's hands now, increasing the risk of World War III. It's a bigger risk than any time in my life so far. So what I would do is a reasonable deal that, yes, allows Ukraine to keep its sovereignty intact, but one that requires Russia to exit its military alliance with China. That's the top objective for lowering the risk of World War III. I'd use our own military to protect our own borders in this country. We're more vulnerable than we have ever been to cyber attacks, super EMP attacks, border defenses that are badly missing and lacking, missile defense systems that are outdated for the modern era. I'll be the president that protects our own homeland better than anybody else because we have a broken foreign policy establishment in both parties that have been fighting wars from Iraq to Afghanistan that have not advanced the American interest. Let's talk specifically about the Middle East. You mentioned Iraq, Afghanistan. Iran, of course, is just an ongoing nemesis my entire life. Uh, we see it in, in now in Israel and the Gaza Strip. What should America's role be in the Middle East? So look, America's role in the Middle East should be looking after American interests and long-run stability. One of the reasons why Israel is an important ally for the U.S. actually relates to China. China is the top threat that we face. We depend on China for our modern way of life. But here's the thing. We can't be everywhere at the same time, which is why we need allies like Israel to stand for, frankly, our own interests. That's what our mutual relationship is about, is about mutual self-interest with Israel, to stand for our interests in the Middle East so that we can focus on our real adversaries in China. At the same time, Israel has an absolute right to defend its own borders. So the way we stand for Israel is give them a diplomatic iron dome. Don't let the UN or the EU or, frankly, even the U.S. second guess those decisions that Israel's making to defend itself. That's a more pro-Israel view in a deeper philosophical sense than anybody else in the Republican field. But you're right. I don't follow the standard GOP talking points 
for me, it's a question of the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And that's our basis for standing. So the U.S. should not get involved in the conflict itself. The U.S. should not militarily engage in this conflict. That's not the U.S.'s interest. That's not even Israel's interest. It's diplomatically giving Israel the space that it needs to defend itself in whatever way Israel deems best without U.S. military engagement. Climate change seems to drive the Biden administration's agenda. Uh, they immediately shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Yes. He was brought into office. They uh, canceled oil and gas leases on federal lands. And now his number one priority seems to be forcing electric vehicles on the American public. What should the role of government be when it comes to private industry? The role of the government should be to get out of the way and let private industry within the bounds of law achieve maximal economic growth and maximal prosperity for the Americans here on American soil. The Biden administration has bent the knee to this globalist climate cult that, by the way, has nothing to do with the climate. Here's why. They're shifting carbon emissions from the U.S. to China. Methane leakage is worse in China than the United States, so that's hypocritical and it's a farce. The very people who are most opposed to fossil fuels are also the opponents to nuclear energy in the United States. Why? Because nuclear energy might be too good at solving their made-up clean energy crisis. So here's what I would do. Favor drilling, fracking, burning coal, embracing nuclear energy, all forms of American energy production right here at home. I stand for that more strongly than probably anybody else in our party because I understand the actual threat from the Department of Interior, from the EPA and otherwise. And here's the good news on this one. I can fix that as the U.S. president because a lot of these constraints on the U.S. energy sector, they haven't even been coming from Congress. They've been coming through backdoor regulation. We can fix it by lifting those backdoor regulations as well. All I need is to successfully win this election to get started. You always talk about truth. You talk about dealing in facts. Is climate change real? And if it is, would the changes that are being proposed, like taking your gas stove, would that suddenly lower temperatures globally? Of course not. And I think that it has many other undesirable consequences. I mean, is climate change real? Climate change has existed as long as the Earth exists. Is it man-made? Well, I think that there are some man-made causes and people on Earth and, and entities on Earth have always resulted in some changes in the climate. But is it an existential risk for mankind? No, it's not. To the contrary, bad climate policies are doing more damage for humanity than climate change itself in the present. That's the real question. And so my view is we need to measure what advances human prosperity, American prosperity. That includes more use of fossil fuels. That also includes more usage of nuclear energy. And the fact that people are opponents to nuclear energy while spouting off about the climate shows how hypocritical this agenda really is. So can there be some factor of climate we need to take into account? That's one of probably a million factors we need to take into account. But the thing I care about is not measuring carbon emissions. It's measuring American and human prosperity. GDP growth is lacking in part because of that climate agenda. That's going to change on my watch. I think I'm the most pro-growth candidate in this race. And you know what? People be, will be more proud of a country when we're all making more money in that country. That's something that would do well to reunite this country. One of your themes has been you get irritated by government control or yes. government trying yes. to control people. How much during COVID, we had masks, we had mandated shots, we had all kinds of things. How much of that was political theater? 99% of it. I would say that the political theater of this is the same theater we're now seeing with the climate religion. It's no accident that as you saw the COVID craze on its waning days, you saw the climate craze pick up with double speed. One of the great lessons from the COVID pandemic is it's in times of supposed emergency that you need free speech and open debate the most. If we had been allowed to debate those lockdowns, we wouldn't have locked down those schools. If you had been allowed to debate the merits of those vaccines being rolled out in nine months, there's no way that we would have mandated those same vaccines. If you had been allowed to say on social media without being censored that the virus originated in a lab in Wuhan, of course, we would have known that much sooner. So I think a lot of that theater took a dark turn when you also censored opposing viewpoints. And to me, that's one of the great lessons of the COVID mistakes, of the many mistakes we made during the pandemic that might be the most important one. I mentioned in the opening, your parents moved to the United States from India. Yeah. You would be the first Indian American president. How would that impact? India has a huge impact on global yep. affairs. How would that impact the United States relationship with India 
And would it have any, any impact with Pakistan, for example? So look, I'm an American. That's the answer. I'm proud of my parents' journey, and I'm proud of the values they instilled in us. But I'm running for U.S. president as an American. Now, I think I'm going to be able to improve relationships with other allies and get more out of those relationships for the U.S. than other presidents have been getting. I'm going to get more out of our relationship with India than the U.S. has been getting so far. I want India to stand more in favor of our ability to declare independence from China, move some of that production not only to the United States, which is our first and most favored solution, but Japan, South Korea, India, and otherwise can also play a role in helping us declare economic independence from China. India should be in a position to block the Andaman Sea if necessary. That's where China gets its Middle Eastern oil supplies. But my ability to do that isn't going to be because I'm Indian American. It's going to be because I'm an American president who stands for U.S. interests. Though, you know what, if there's one person who's going to fix and upgrade the utility of our relationship with India, it better be somebody with a last name like Ramaswamy. <laughs> Before we go, you have talked in terms of cutting the government. Yeah. 75% as far as worker jobs. Tell me specifically, what are agencies you would cut? How would their current role be filled? Sure. Would they be filled? 75% reduction in the number of federal bureaucrats by the end of my first term. I believe we can achieve close to 50% of that within my first month in office. We have a very clear plan for achieving this. Shut down redundant agencies that shouldn't exist. The FBI, the ATF, the CDC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, even the U.S. Department of Education. These are agencies that don't need to exist. We'll shut them down reorganize some of those functions. The vocational training piece of the U.S. Department of Education will move to the Department of Labor. The FBI, the 15,000 agents on the front lines, will move them to the U.S. Marshals or to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the U.S. Treasury or to the DEA on the front lines of the fentanyl epidemic. But the 20,000 back office bureaucrats where the cost and the corruption comes from, they're going to find honest work in the private sector. So I will go agency by agency and, and really make specific changes, the ATF, the limited piece of background checks, move that to the U.S. Marshals. We have a comprehensive plan. This is how you drain the swamp. It's not just slogans. It's a clear plan, a mass reduction in the size of the federal employee headcount, including agency shutdowns. But it's going to take a president coming from the outside to do this, somebody who is not captured by the special interests to be able to do this. But now more than ever, a leader, I believe, from the next generation, with fresh legs to take our America First movement to the next level. And that's what I'm in this race to do. I think we're gonna be successful. Final question, that is in 2012, Mitt Romney was the GOP nominee. Senator Romney now says, if you are the nominee, he will not support you. If, I know your goal is to win. I know you have a path how to win. If for some reason you are not the nominee, will you support whomever is the Republican nominee? I support this country and I think that Mitt Romney, I understand that his niece, who's leading the RNC, was someone who's the same person who said that I won't get another cent of funding from the RNC and who was booing me on that debate stage. So I am a challenge and a threat to the Republican establishment. It's no surprise that they're striking back at me, but I'm an American. As I said earlier, not an Indian American, not a red or blue American. I'm an American, and I'm using the America First agenda and using our vision for putting this country first, our pro-American agenda, to use the Republican Party as a vessel for advancing that agenda. That's what I think. And obviously, I know the answer. I know what you're going to say to this. But do you see the path between now and in January? You've got Iowa and New Hampshire and then on from there. Do you see the path for presidential nominee Ramaswamy? Absolutely. No doubt about it. I think that we're going to pull a shock both here in Iowa and New Hampshire. Even the events we've had even in the last 72 hours. The number of people who come to our events who have never been to a caucus, who are younger voters included, is staggering. They are not polled. So you mark my words, we're going to deliver a major surprise on January 15th at the Iowa caucus. And after that, that's going to propel us forward. I expect I will absolutely be the nominee. And once I am, we can win this general election in a landslide by bringing many of those young people and independents along with us. His name is Vivek Ramaswamy. He is running for president of the United States. Thank you, sir. A pleasure. It's good seeing you. Vivek Ramaswamy, the bombastic nature of Donald Trump. In some ways, the smooth polish of Barack Obama. Maybe most importantly, virtually no similarities with President Joe Biden. 
Ramaswamy is stridently America first. He wants to keep the U.S. out of worldwide conflicts, and he's quite sure climate change is not the most important issue of our time. He wants to fundamentally change the nature of economics between the United States and China, which could have huge consequences economically all over the world. He is supremely confident, brash to the party around him. He goes so far as to call the Republican Party a party of losers. Can Ramaswamy make the Republican Party win again? Time will tell. The Iowa vote is set for January 15th. From Washington, D.C., for the Capitol Hill Show, I'm Tim Constantine. Thank you for joining us.